All right, there we have it. He did identify the defendant in the courtroom. Matt, let me bring you back in as our analyst today and ask you, so what import is it that this person who was robbed at gunpoint now says that's the defendant who robbed me when we're in court on an unrelated murder trial? Well, they're trying to, to the, the prosecution is trying to, to get the gun that was stolen uh, from that witness uh, in that hotel room um, to be in the hands of the defendant because ultimately it was the same gun that was used in, in the homicide and the assault uh, of the prices. So, so this is, you know, sort of, this is circumstantial evidence. They're, they're trying to connect pieces. You know, here's the guy that, that, that committed the robbery. Uh, a gun was taken. That gun was used in the murder. Okay, so when there is a circumstantial case like this one, given we've already heard the wife who survived was not able to identify the defendants, um, the prosecution, do they have to lay out every little piece of evidence and connect the dots, ideally in a perfect case, so to speak? Right. There's nothing wrong with a circumstantial evidence case. Uh, and it's the responsibility of the prosecutor to put these pieces of the puzzle together so that the jury can can understand the big picture and understand how all these things relate and, and make a decision based not on eyewitness identification, uh, not on uh, forensic evidence necessarily, but by putting together all these little pieces of the, uh, of the puzzle to, to prove that these defendants are responsible for the the murder and the assault. And I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes. I want to know if it's easier to defend a circumstantial case. But first, let's listen to Mitchell's testimony, the victim of the robbery, on cross-examination. Uh, just maybe Shane, Jess, Daryl Hansford, and cops. Did you talk to James Daryl? And um, you have a Facebook account, correct? Yeah. And so you posted Do you recognize this picture? Is that Facebook post? That's your Facebook account? Okay, so... That was written out of anger there. Yeah. Mm. So hard. And during that lineup, you picked two people. Felt like they looked like. Well, note my exact words were that day. It's this guy, but he has this guy's nose. I don't know if he just had his nose flared up that night, like he was all angry or what, but it was this guy. But he had his a big nose like this guy. And And you just went over to the wall where you had written number two and five look most like the man yep. with dress, correct? Okay. Well, you just heard the defense doing what they are supposed to do, and that is poke holes in that victim's story and identification of the defendant in this case. Now, how do how does the prosecution do what Matt said and, and put the puzzle together and actually link the gun to the murder? You will want to come back after this short break so that we can find out the answer to that question. All right, so we're returning to the Marine murder trial, the victim speaks. But now we're going to hear from Detective Upchurch. He is the one that's testifying about the gun, remember, that was taken from the robberies that occurred a few days prior to the murder. Let's see what his testimony reveals. During that time, 
we had the homicide that involved uh, the victim, Jonathan Price. And through that investigation, um, we learned that a Springfield 45 XDS was the weapon that was ultimately used in that homicide. Uh, detectives in the unit started querying the reports uh, that we had uh, prior to that to see if we had any light crimes uh, involving a, a firearm such as that and or a firearm that was stolen and that was that would have matched the description of that. Uh, that's when we learned that my victims in the Holiday Inn robbery had, had a Springfield XDS 45 caliber stolen uh, that we believe could possibly be involved in the homicide. What had, did anything happen, I guess, initially with that information? You said they queried it and determined that the Springfield was stolen at the Quality Inn um, robbery. What occurred at that point? Uh, I know that we started looking at video surveillance, uh, and especially there was a uh, detective looking at video surveillance in the uh, homicide of Mr. Duncan Fives. At some point, um, At some point, did um, there become information that Mr. Canada and Mr. Malazan may have been involved in this robbery? Yes. There are a lot of pieces in this case. So the shell casings found at the murder scene matched a gun that was stolen during the robbery. Matt, let me bring you back in as our expert in this case. What do you do with that little piece of testimony as defense? Well, in a defense, you're, you're going to look at the big picture and, and try to, um, you know, pound away that, hey, you know, that's just because this gun was used. We don't know who these people were who used the gun. Um, but the prosecution is, put, is trying to put every little piece of evidence together to paint a broader picture uh, for, for the jury. Hey, this isn't just about identification at the scene. This was a traumatic incident. Obviously, uh, the victim was, sh was, was shaken up. Uh, but we can, if we piece this together, you can see how it, how it all fits and how these guys at the robbery were the same guys, the defendants in this case. All right. So is it unfair for me to say that it's got to be easier for a defense attorney to prove reasonable doubt in a circumstantial case as opposed to one with direct evidence? Is that a fair statement or not? It is a fair statement. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, the prosecution has to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So when you're working with a circumstantial case and you have to connect all these dots and put a bigger picture together, it gives an opportunity for defense attorneys to attack at each one of those uh, instances where you're trying to link things together. And, and, and you can argue to a jury that, hey, you know, there's reasonable doubt here. Um, you know, we, we don't know exactly what happened. The prosecution is asking you to fill in the blanks. And if you have to fill in those blanks, then you may have a reasonable doubt. All right. So let's find out what about the gun? Where is the gun? Well, this next witness may be able to tell us that. Um, the text message that uh, our CI had received from Mr. Fry. Uh, and again, the CI knew Mr. Fry. We had already purchased guns from Mr. Fry. Uh, but at that point in time on that day, that he had a 45 caliber for sale for $350. Okay. Did you arrange for a buy to occur between the CI and Mr. Fry? We did. We did what's, control, control, what's called a controlled buy. Um, we meet with our CI. We search the CI. We search his vehicle. We provide the CI with uh, the equipment of recording devices. Um, we provide him with official funds to make the purchase. Uh, then once he um, is in his or her vehicle, we will follow them to the predestined location where the buy is supposed to occur, um, which is what we did on that day. Okay, and tell us about how much was the CI supposed to buy this gun for? Uh, the CI was supposed to, be, to spend $350 to purchase a 45 caliber firearm, which he did. Um, in addition, once the buy is done, the CI is then followed to a location that's predetermined by us. We will, we, we will meet the CI, we will search him again, we will search his vehicle again, and take custody of the evidence, which in this case was a 45 caliber fire, uh, and the recording devices. 
And did you do that in this case? In this, uh, on this particular day with this guy, we did. Okay, can you tell us about that? Uh, the CI parked on uh, Nelson Avenue and myself and Special Agent Hoover uh, parked approximately 40 yards from where the CI was parked and observed at that time an individual that we knew to be Mr. Ant Antonio Fry entered the CI's vehicle. Okay. And did, the, did he get back out of the vehicle? Uh, the vehicle moved uh, about 10, 15 feet on Nelson uh, after a few minutes then. He all right, so that ATF agent just says, hey, the gun was found on Antonio Fry. Now, Matt, I have to point out the obvious to me. Antonio Fry is not one of the two defendants in this case. What do you do as defense? That's a great score for you. All right, the, the defense is going to jump all over this. I mean, the chain is broken. So, so they made a connection from, from the robbery uh, to, to the scene of the homicide, but now that chain is broken. A third person has possession of that gun. The defense is going to say, could that have been the person who committed this uh, murder, or could someone else have had possession with that of that gun between the robbery and, and the murder? Look, and you know, juries are sophisticated. They have to put all this together. I have no doubt they're capable of doing that, but it gets pretty convoluted as we listen to more witnesses. Come back after this break because we are going to have testimony directly from the person who talks about cross-examining and what happened with that gun. Well, I have to tell you as a judge, I feel like this defense attorney is playing it just right. Instead of jumping up and down and yelling and screaming and making the witness a hostile witness, he's pretty laid back because all he's doing is saying, okay, let me make sure I understand. The guns used in the robbery and the gun used in the murder were not found on these two defendants. And the answer is yes. Matt, let me bring you back in as my expert criminal defense attorney and ask you, why not case over? With this testimony to me, it's a sealed deal for the defense there can't be a conviction. What, what's your opinion? Well, uh, you know, as, as this case proceeds, the, the prosecution has their hands full. Um, you know, we know that, that the same gun was at the robbery, was at the, was at the uh, homicide scene, but, but it wasn't found on the, either one of these defendants. Um, you know, we have the issue that we've already discussed about identification of these individuals at the scene of the of the homicide. So, yeah, I mean, it, th this is a difficult case for the prosecution. They have to try to put all these pieces together. But, you know, do these pieces uh, have any weight or substance to them? And in your experience, can you ever really predict when you're in trial what a judge or a jury is going to do? Oh, you never can. Um, you know, especially a jury. Uh, you, you never know what's going through their mind. I mean, there's a lot of research out there that says that, you know, some jurors make up their mind after the opening statements. Um, and, and, you know, every time I've tried a case, the first place I go is to the jurors to, to talk to them, whether it's a, it was, I was successful in the prosecution or defense. And uh, you're just surprised by what they tell you. You know, things that you never thought were significant were, were the, the, the factor that, that put them one over the edge one way or the other. It's, it's really incredible to talk to jurors after a trial. And I, and I often spend time talking with, with, with people who are not involved in the case before the trial, and they give great input. Uh, that you never really think about. So you never know what's going through a juror's mind. And you made a perfect point for me to segue into the next clip, and that is you said sometimes you hear jurors make a decision after opening statement. Let's listen to how the defense handles the fact that neither defendant had the gun in their possession when they made their opening statement in this trial. But there is genetic markers, alleles, DNA, found under Mr. Price's fingernails. DNA that excludes Dewan Malazan. DNA that excludes Princinio, Canada. But before Detective Wolf learned the results of that DNA analysis, he had already decided who his suspects were. Facing immense pressure to solve a high-profile murder in a summer of high-profile murders, Detective Wolf from the Lexington Police Department assumed they knew who did it. They assumed it was Duan Malazzo. They assumed it was Pensinio Canada. In making that assumption, they ignored information from a local attorney saying he had a client who wanted to meet with the police 
about this very case, not Juan Malazan, not Quincinio Canada. And despite the fact that no eyewitness, not a frame of video, shows gold teeth or facial tattoos, they proceeded against Mr. Malazan and Mr. Canada. They had their suspects, and once this assumption was formed, it would not be revisited. And that's why I love law and crime, because you just heard an opening statement. The defense said, hey, the gun was found on Mr. Fry, not on either of these defendants. And sure enough, that's what the evidence has shown. So where do we go from here? Prosecution is going to present a firearms expert, because now you have to match the bullets to the gun. We're going to take a short break, but come right back to hear more of the testimony. So, Matt, this firearms expert is testifying to match the bullets used in the murder with the bullets in the gun that's already been brought into evidence. My question is, how do you make this type of testimony exciting for a jury or something that they're compelled to listen to? Because, quite frankly, as a lot of experts can be, it's a little bit dry to go through the explanation of it. Well, you know, when you don't have a, a, a great case and you don't have a lot of evidence, you want to make a big deal out of every piece of evidence that you have. Um, you know, we know that, that this was the same gun. Um, you know, that's already kind of been testified to. Um, and we also know that they weren't in possession of it when the authorities uh, found this gun. But, you know, the, the prosecution wants to show the jury, hey, you know, here's the scientific evidence. You know, it's unequivocal that this is the same gun in the robbery. This is the same gun at the homicide scene. It, it fired the the, uh, the the bullets that injured and killed uh, somebody. But, you know, if I was the defense, I'd stipulate to that because it's not really that big of a deal. Um, you know, what's the big deal here is that uh, you can't identify who fired that gun. And how do you make a strategic decision about whether you're going to stipulate to that or make them prove it and bring it into evidence? Well, I think in this situation, obviously, a stipulation has to be an agreement between the prosecution and the defense. Um, the defense probably would stipulate, but I don't think the prosecution would because their case is weak and they want to make a big deal again about every little piece of evidence that they have. And by bringing in that expert and saying this was the same gun that was fired, you know, it helps, you know, at least fill in the time in terms of presenting a case to the jury. All right. So we're, we're going to get to the verdict later on during the show. But do you have any gut based on your experience and the evidence presented so far? What would you guess? Guilty or not guilty on the charge of murder? I think it's a long shot for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these uh, two defendants are responsible uh, for the death of Corporal Price and the assault of his wife. All right. So I want to pick your brain about a whole different topic now. I want to go to Harvey Weinstein. We covered this at Law and Crime this morning and talked about the fact he was back in court today. He is facing six felony charges, including one of rape. This is one that most everyone has heard about because there are numerous actresses who came out with different types of allegations against him. He's a defendant in these claims, including one of rape, really horrific tales and, and information being brought forward by multiple victims, many stars, big names that we all know, and he's facing these charges. Now, as a defense attorney, what happened is it was very quick. He walked in. There were a number of different people with him, lawyers. I understand some of the people were his PR people. He goes in. He sits in the benches. He doesn't sit up front. The judge then does call the case. The attorneys go up to the stand. Long story short, I understand that they had some motions asking charges to be dismissed. None of that happened. The six felony charges remain against Harvey Weinstein. Now, in your experience, are these typical motions that a defense attorney is going to make on behalf of their client? Yes. I mean, this is a high profile case. Um, you have a defendant who has resources and uh, the defense is going to zealously um, do everything that they can to try to prevent this case from, from getting in front of a jury. Uh, you know, obviously, multiple women 
uh, who who uh, would be very sympathetic. Uh, you don't want this case to be in a trial. So you're going to do everything you can uh, and use every resource that's available to you to try to, to, to stop this case uh, from moving forward. So given the publicity, let's Monday night, uh, Monday night quarterback, and that is why would they or would either side want this to have been such a short proceeding without much attention, without much possibility for coverage? Is that an advantage or a disadvantage to him at this point in the game? Well, there's been so much publicity about this case. And, and you know, we're, we're 14 months into this publicity at this point. Um, you know, I don't think it, it's going to make much of a difference, you know, how much pretrial publicity this this case uh, generates, um, you know, at this point, you know, what are you going to do? Where, where do you find a, a, a venue that people are going to say, I haven't heard anything about um, about this case? So so I don't know that it's even that that big of a deal. I mean, today, you know, it may just be a, a matter of, of, of scheduling, of, of, of talking about some issues uh, between the prosecution and the defense and the court to see where this matter is going to go, uh, you know, from this point. But certainly uh, there was no testimony. There, there was nothing other than a discussion between the attorneys and the judge. So, you know, as a judge, when I hear a case, regardless of the amount of publicity around any case, it's all about my docket and I'm going to manage it efficiently, but also ensure that everything that needs to be handled at that time is handled. So I feel like regardless of what requests might be made by defense or prosecution, so long as it doesn't interfere with constitutional rights, policy, law, procedure, then I'm going to run it fairly quickly and efficiently. In your experience, do judges make that decision more than the prosecution or defense in terms of when the case is going to be heard and how it's going to be handled? Oh, uh, definitely. I mean, I, I think that the uh, court will give some deference to counsel with regard to their schedule and other things. But, hey, this is a high-profile case. This case is going to generate a lot of attention. And, and no matter how it proceeds, it's going to be a, re a reflection not only on the attorneys and the defendant, but also on the court. And the court, as you indicated, is mindful of these things. And they don't want that reflection to be a poor reflection in terms of this case you know, stalling or, or being extended or being continued over and over again. So the court is very mindful uh, of how this is going to be perceived as well and wants to show an efficient uh, uh, docket and, and an efficient process with regard to this trial. All right. Well, I appreciate your analysis because obviously we've all been following this case. We're going to continue to follow it here on Law and Crime. We're going to take a short break, but you will want to come back. We're going to hear closing arguments as we move towards the verdict in this case. Were the two defendants convicted of murder or not? Stay tuned. Just walking through all the pieces of evidence in their closing to convince the jury to convict these two defendants of murder. And she gets a little frustrated, I think, with things defense counsel has said in their questioning. So, Matt, we were talking on a break, and you said the, your perception of a rush to judgment. What does that mean? Tell, tell our viewers. Well, when you look at the evidence that's presented in this case, and that's what these arguments are going to, are going to um, talk about, um, you know, the gold standard uh, typically is DNA evidence or eyewitness identification. In this situation, um, we have neither. Uh, in fact, we have DNA that doesn't match the defendants, and we have eyewitness identification that doesn't put them at the crime scene. Um, you know, so was this a rush to judgment? Uh, you know, it's it's a high profile case. You know, it's a corporal who's killed uh, in the Marine Corps, and his and his uh, girlfriend is wounded. So, you know. Did they find some suspects and then try to make the evidence work for those suspects? So and that's, you, that's I'm probably, sorry, I get interrupted. Go ahead. No, I said that, you know, that, that idea is troubling, and I think the defense will make a big deal about it. And I just was going to ask, have you seen any cases where you felt like they tried to fit the suspect to the evidence in your career? Oh, certainly, and, and, and it's unfortunate. Uh, in those situations where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, be, before, you know, the, the crime scene is even cleared, um, you know, the, the prosecutors and, and police officers are out, you know, uh, at somebody's home uh, you know, with a search warrant. I mean, you know, those kind of things uh, you know, are of great concern. You know, you 
you can't have tunnel vision when you're investigating a crime. You, you have to be open minded. The evidence may lead you in different directions and you have to let the evidence lead you there. Don't go someplace and then try to make the evidence work with what your theory or hypothesis is of the case. And regardless of what people think about different trials, I will tell you, to me, that is why it is so important for there to be a good criminal defense attorney involved to protect the rights of the defendant in case that happens. Scary to think that it does. Now, we are going to take a short break, but you will not want to miss. We are going to find out what did the jury do in this case. Let's hear the verdict after we come back from this break. Welcome back. We are still covering the trial of Kentucky versus two defendants, Canada and Malazan. And this is the case in which the Marine was murdered. His wife was injured. She spoke. She testified about what happened. She was shot in the leg. Her um, husband was shot and killed. So is there going to be a guilty verdict in this case? Two defendants facing murder convictions. We've listened to the evidence. We've listened to the prosecution closing. Now we're going to listen to the defense closing to see what they argue about this circumstantial case. He did not do the line. Um, and that's not a big deal. He's done a lot of lineups, over 100. Sometimes he does them for his own cases. Sometimes he does them for other cases. But in this particular case, Mr. Kidd's photo was altered, and it was altered to conform with what the victim said as far as description goes as to their attackers. The star tattoo was taken off of his face, and now we've heard explanation, but the thing is, there's plenty of people with face tattoos. You can do a six-pack with face tattoos. Surely, if the description included a face tattoo, this would not have been the outcome. But here we are. And so he took this altered lineup and he showed it to Shane Hansford. And Shane Hansford could not make an identification. And he showed it to Jessica, Rutherford then Hansford now, couldn't make an identification. So he showed it to Mitchell Smith. And Mitchell Smith said, these two people are the two people that look most like the person that robbed me. These two people. If you're picking between these two people, then you're not giving an adequate enough effort, or you don't know what you're talking about. Now, he had a nice little explanation when he was here. He... If you remember, he said, what I meant was, on the day, it was this person with this person's nose. Okay, well, he didn't tell us which one was which, and this isn't Mr. Potato Head or something like that. We can take a look at his form. Here is a spot for a narrative. And so if that were the case... If he was really sitting down saying, I feel really good about this one, but I think the nose looked more like this one, then you put it right here. You put it right here, and then it's safe for posterity. And then when you get to trial and you say that, then they say, see, he did say that. Now, this is a brand new explanation. <laughs> Number two plus five looked most like the man with the dreads that robbed me at gunpoint. If I saw them in person, I could make a distinction from there and see how tall they were. Notice he didn't initial, we've got a line here, initial one, he didn't initial, please initial here if you understand these instructions, so perhaps he didn't understand the instructions. But that's what he wrote. And then that's what he wrote the next day. Mitchell Smith did not identify Insignia Canada. He would not be reliable to identify anyone who's African American. 
by his own words, and by Detective Upchurch's words. To Miss Green, if Detective Upchurch knew about this, he wouldn't even gave him the lineup in the first place. None of this was recorded. There were seemingly um, two reasons why this wasn't recorded. Even though, as you see, most everything is recorded, and it's supposed to be recorded. But this wasn't. Well, I didn't want to make him nervous. Okay, I guess that's a reason not to record. You didn't want to make him nervous. You had him in a car. There were two police officers and one person in the car at a time. So, you could have recorded them without them knowing. That's perfectly legal. And the moment that you think, well, that seems a little weird because we're not being upfront with them. Well, your sheet here says, number three, I do not know whether the person being investigated is included in this series. Starting in mid-July of 2014, that wide net that Mr. Tracy talked about, that Detective Wolf talked closing. There are two defendants, so that's why there are two defense attorneys making closings. Matt, let's talk a little bit about trial skills. Now, you know we have the opening statement where the prosecution defense, they're required to say, this is what I expect the evidence will show in this case. Closing, though, you have a lot more leeway, and that's when you get to argue, this is what the evidence was, and this is why it does or doesn't prove my case. And so I think as an attorney, you can have a lot more fun, so to speak, with the closing and trying to get your point across to the jury. Did you find offense was compelling in their closing statement? Well, I, I did. And in, in, in their case, you know, they have, you know, a strong defense uh, and they have so many things that they want to touch on uh, that and, and they want to be methodical about it and they don't want to be necessarily emotional about it. Uh, they're not really blaming anybody necessarily. They're just saying, hey, this case doesn't you know, make it. It's not, they haven't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think they're methodically pointing it out. Now that, you know, the difference between an opening, as you indicated, is, you know, what you intend to prove. And then your closing is, you know, what was proven during this case. And if you're the defendant, you're going to suggest that they haven't met their burden of proof. That burden never shifts. It's always on the prosecution to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And here the defense is going piece by piece through the evidence and saying, hey, they just don't, they don't make it. They, they didn't hit that threshold. So listen, we've all seen high profile trials where the defense does come up with some theme or catchy line, OJ Simpson, you know, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. So does the defense have to do that in this case? Should they have come up with something like, oh, no ID must go free? Is that really necessary to convince a jury not to convict a defendant? It's all a matter of style. It, it, it depends, you know, what a defense attorney feels most comfortable doing and, you know, what they need to do in, in a particular case. You know, sometimes a slogan like that will divert attention from other issues that are damaging to the defendant. And so you harp on this on this slogan or this this idea uh, of one specific thing here. This case lacked I.D., lacked DNA evidence, in fact, had DNA evidence that was other than the defendants, uh, you know, the victim couldn't identify the gun that was used. Um, 
that there just was a lot to work with here, uh, plus bad defense witnesses. Uh, you know, so, 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 hey, the defense here is just going to put it out there, tell the jury, this isn't a good case. They didn't meet their burden, and you need to find my client or our clients not guilty. Let's see. Did the jury agree with the defense or not? What we've all been waiting for, the verdict in this case. So the judge was reading two verdicts, one for each of the defendants, not guilty of murder. Now, they were convicted of robbery. In terms of sentencing, I want to share with you, one of them was uh, to serve 60 years. The other defendant, Canada, to spend 50 years in jail. So by not being convicted of murder, they did not face the death penalty. Matt? One last opportunity. Do you think they'll appeal given the number of years they are facing serving in jail or not? Well, no question. There'll be there'll be appeals filed in this case. You know, we have another issue of a hung jury on some of these um, counts as well. You know, but, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with the pretrial matters in this, but I, I think issues that would be uh, for appellate review or why were these cases tried together and why were these defendants tried together? Those are two fundamental issues that I think will be reviewed. Oh, great point. Matt, I so appreciate you being with us today. We always appreciate your legal analyst uh, work with law and crime. I do want to ask you one more question in this case, just to yeah. recap the whole thing. Are you surprised that they were not convicted of murder, but were on the robbery charges based on the evidence presented? Uh, I'm not surprised. And, and sometimes, you know, that's an issue for appellate review. Was this a compromise verdict? Hey, you know, we'll take the death penalty off the off the table, uh, but we'll convict them of robbery and then we'll hammer them with a long sentence. 
I mean, those are those are issues that may need review. All right. Matt Mangino, thank you again for joining us today. Always happy to have you. Thanks for having me. You will not want to miss. We're going to come back after break and we're going to look at Texas versus Cody Lott, two 13 year olds. Uh, shot. One of them was killed. The victim who survived testifies in the case. Again, today we're looking at trials in which the surviving victim testifies. Does it make a difference? Will there be a conviction in the Cody Lott case out of Texas? You will need to come back after this break to join us in our expert analysis of that trial.